This morning, our sermon lesson comes from Mark chapter 8. Normally, we read our sermon lesson beforehand. Today, we're going to read it at the end and meditate on it throughout. So I want to invite you to please take your seats and let's go before our God in prayer. Son of man, we come before you and we pray, Lord, that we are not ashamed of you or any of your words, but help us to love your words. Help us to latch on to all your promises that you give us in your word. We pray this in your saving name. Amen. Let's, let's begin this morning with a fill in the blank. And I'm not going to suggest any words to you, just a reaction. How would you fill this in? I blank as a result of my connection to Christ. What would you put in there? Some of you actually do fill in the blanks or take sermon notes. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to write down what you might put in there or think of what you might put in there. Ready, go. That was actually 12 seconds. I gave you two bonus seconds. Now, how about this? Would your answer change at all if, if we put one four-letter word in front of this? I must blank as a result of my connection to Christ. Would your answer change? Would you, would you put the same thing? As I mentioned at the introduction to our sermon lesson or our worship service this morning, we are in the second week of a sermon series that we're calling Rethinking Religion. Why? Why do we need to rethink religion? Well, it's because there is nothing that does not impact our thoughts or our assumptions about God. It could be where you grew up. It could be the parents who you grew up with. Maybe it was the pastor that you had when you first got married or the church you went to when you were in college. Maybe it was a book that you've recently read about God or religion or spirituality. Everything influences our thinking about God, about religion. So it brings up the question, how do you know that your thoughts, your thinking about religion are correct? Perhaps we need to test our assumptions. And, and that's what we're doing throughout this sermon series. Now, I tell you this, I love every sermon series that we do at this church, and maybe I'm biased. So it's always noteworthy to me when other people love it as much or more than I do. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful that after our first week in this sermon series, there was a disproportionate amount of people who told me how much they enjoyed not just last week's topic of rethinking suffering, but really the whole premise, the whole idea behind our, our emphasis throughout Lent, that we're going to test our assumptions, that we're going to rethink the way we think about worship and sin and discipleship. And today, crosses. And I'm grateful. I'm, I'm very grateful and in fact excited and impressed by the humility of so many people to be willing to offer up that maybe they don't know all that they think they know about religion and spirituality. And I say that, I share that with you because today comes with a warning, a warning that we're going to rethink what we might put in this blank. And like we're doing throughout this series, we're rethinking it by, by taking what we think captive well, to what God's word says and what Christ says in his word must go in this blank. To do that, we're going to look at Jesus' own teaching in Mark chapter 8, a teaching that summarizes the very essence of what the Christian faith is, that's part one, the essence of the Christian faith. And part two, Jesus summarizes quite simply and quite clearly the entire essence of what our life as followers of Christ are all about. The essence of the Christian faith itself 
And here we have the very essence of Christian life. So let's begin with part one of this, the essence of the Christian faith. Jesus, in this section, begins in this way. He began to teach them. What Jesus does is begin. Just, he just starts to teach his disciples who are gathered around him something that you and I, his disciples gathered here today, something we will never finish learning. What we have, I'm preparing you for this, what we have in these words that follow, in this verse and the several verses that follow, is really what all the Bible is about. Every other passage is simply commentary on what Jesus begins to teach here. I said it's the essence. It is the quintessential part of the Christian faith is what Jesus begins to cover here. And he does so in this way. Jesus begins to teach them, well, about the Son of Man. He uses a very particular, very interesting name for himself, a name that he uses for himself more than any other. He doesn't call himself the Lord of Lords or Christ. He calls himself the Son of Man. He highlights for his disciples that he is at once the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord Almighty, but he is God born of a woman born miraculously of a virgin. He is true God and also true man. He is the son of man. And he must. He, he must do something. Be about something. Now that, that word should give us pause because you all know what must means, right? It means it's necessary. And remember that God refers to himself as the Son of Man, but re remember who he is. He, he's God. And about God, let me tell you this. He is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. Let me translate what that doctrine means very practically. God doesn't have to do anything that he doesn't want to. So what does it mean that God, the Son of Man, must do something? Well, it, give, it should give us pause when we encounter this word because Jesus, who is God and yet true man, the son of man, he doesn't have to do anything except if he says it's a necessity. Except if he alone dictates it's a must. And so what does he, what does he share with us he must do? He must suffer. He must. He has to suffer. That's what the Son of Man must do. And why? Well, remember who this is. It's, it's God who created the world and all things, you and me, in perfection, to enjoy nothing but peace and joy and blessedness with him and all creation. So why must he suffer? Well, you know. It's because Adam and Eve fell into sin. And every one of their children since, you and me, suffers because of the consequence of sin. We suffer death. We suffer strains in our people-to-people -people relationships. We suffer pain and suffering because of our relationship with this world. There is only suffering. And so now we're getting at it. The Son of Man is teaching us something. He's teaching us something not just about himself and what his name is and what he must do, He's teaching us something about his very heart. The fact that, that he has freely chosen, necessitated your salvation through him. That he's God. He, he doesn't have to suffer. He didn't do anything wrong, but he said it. He said he must suffer for your sins and mine. What we're learning is that that he didn't have to in one sense, and yet he made it necessary. He freely chose to make something necessary for you and me. That he must suffer, and suffer what? Many things. 
think about the things that Jesus suffered. He, he suffered rejection, yes, by his, his friends and family and his, his people that he came to save. But he also suffered something far worse. He suffered rejection. He suffered the very isolation of God himself as he bore the sins of the world. And yes, he, he suffered. He suffered nails through his hands. He suffered on a cross, a, a tool that was designed for torture. He did suffer many things there. But he was there. Why? To, to suffer something even greater than any physical pain. A spiritual weight. Think about the, the worst thing that you've ever said or have done. Think about that thing. Now times it by the 120 some billion people that have ever lived. He suffered many things. All of those things as a payment for our sins. And that's just the one worst thing that everybody's done. He suffered many things. He suffered for every single one of the sins that you and I deserve. This is what he must do. He had to do it. And he had to do it in this way, that he would be rejected by the very people who came, he came to save. People who, who didn't get along with one another by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. No, he suffered specifically in this way, that they got together to carry out his death. He said it must happen. And not just that he would suffer in this way, that he would suffer in this exact time by these people carrying out his suffering, but his suffering must result in death. There it is again, the strongest word possible that he must not just suffer, but he must be killed. This, this is the essence of the Christian faith. Jesus saying that this has to happen. And why? So that you don't. Remember, he freely chose to make our salvation a necessity. He suffered to the point of death. Why? So that you and I would never experience death, never experience the spiritual separation from God that he was experiencing there on the cross. So that you and I, who deserve wrath, who deserve punishment, condemnation, whatever synonym works to highlight the fact that we have consequences for our sins. He suffered so that you and I wouldn't have consequences. And yet he's not done yet. He must suffer. He must be killed. <laughs> but he must not let death get the last word. He must rise again. He must not let death have the final say in the matter. No, Look at this. Oh, what sweet joy the sentence gives. I know, you know, my Redeemer, even before he died, called his shot and said, I'm going to die, but I actually, I must. I must live. And why? Well, just step back and, and let, the, let the weight, the gravity of what he is teaching you here sink in. That you and I would have life. This all must happen so that you and I experience a resurrection reality in our own lives from the sin and the guilt and the shame that looks to drown us out and keep us separated from the Father. It is no more. Death has been defeated. Sin is gone. Forgiveness and life are what we have. Why? Because he said so. Well, it wasn't really necessary, but he so loved you. He so desired to be with you forever. They said it must happen. It must happen in this way, that I suffer many things, rejection, even death, but I must, I must rise again. Friends, that is part one. That is, that is the essence of the Christian faith. We ask the question, what, what might we fill in here? Let's ask like a different one for a moment. What would, what would Jesus fill in? He would fill in this, that I, I must suffer. I must suffer many things. Why? As a result of my connection to Matt. As a result of my connection of you put your name in there. He said it must be this way. This is it. This is, this is the essence of the Christian faith. There's, there is nothing else in scripture that doesn't comment on this or support this or just further explain this. There's nothing more to it. 
That's what the Christian faith is about. And yet part one's not done. Because here comes Peter. Peter hears all this. He hears Jesus plainly speak about this. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. It wasn't just a sharp, no, Jesus. No, it, it was a thought out process that he began here. You can see Peter's wheel starting to turn. Okay. Suffering, rejection, death. All right. I don't know about that resurrection thing. All right. No, no, no. I'm going to, I'm going to begin to lecture you, Jesus. He, he actually brings him aside. He's teaching all the disciples. Jesus, Jesus then sees Peter go, come on over here. And he takes him aside and he begins a process, a speech even, maybe he has prepared for him and says, Jesus, no. This is not what's going to happen to you. Let me save you a little time and uh, energy here and, and some pain, it seems. Jesus, no, this might, this must never happen. Here is the essence of the Christian faith, what all of God's plan of salvation is leading up to. And Peter says, no, 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 <laughs> not that suffering. No. Can we, can we blame Peter, though, as, as silly as it, as it looks? He hears about suffering. He hears about death. And he only wants the good things from Jesus. He knows what Jesus has been doing, what he's been given through Jesus. How often don't, don't we do the same thing? We say, Jesus, we, we love you. And all of your blessings tone down the, the suffering and the brutality a little bit. Jesus, we want the crown, the crown of glory that we know is going to be ours because you overcame. But the cross, Jesus, whoo, not so much of that. Is it a surprise that because this is the very essence of the Christian faith, that Jesus responds in this way? When Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Brutal. I mean, why didn't Jesus just say to Peter, oh, Peter, how slow you are to believe. Here, here, my friend, you'll see. Don't worry. In a few days, you'll see everything. It's just as I said. Why didn't he, why didn't he do that? Why wasn't he more gentle with Peter? Why did he look at him and say, get behind me, you, Satan, devil, you're thinking not God thoughts. You're thinking devilish, Peter. Why didn't he keep it private? Peter took him aside and just had a one-on-one. -on -one. What does Jesus do? He turns, looks at his disciples, says, y'all are going to make sure you're going to see this. And then he rebukes Peter. Why? Because this is no different than what the devil did to Jesus in the wilderness. He gave, him a, he gave him an out. He gave him an out and said, you can have the crown. You can have all of the good without the cross. But it's even worse, you see, because it's from the lips of a friend. He tried to askew the cross as the central piece of the essence of the Christian faith. That's what Peter did. Do we do that as well? Here's part two. Part two, the essence of the Christian life. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, just for a moment, think about the movements going on here. Jesus hanging out with just his disciples, teaching just his disciples about what he must suffer, the many things. Then he moves to a private conversation with just Peter. And then back to all the disciples. And now he opens it up. He opens it up to not just Peter, not just the disciples, but to the entire crowd. And what does he say? 
He says, friends, this is the essence of the Christian faith. The Christian life, it's this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever wants to lose their life for me and the gospel will save it. Here it is. This is it. There's really no more. And there's surely no less. This is the essence of the Christian life. I mean, all the time we want to know a lot about our faith, and that's good. We want to know about all the teachings of God's word, and that's good. He said we should, we should, we should learn everything he has commanded us. There's nothing more than this. Everything ties in and together with this. You want to know what it, what it means to be my follower, Jesus says? Very simply, pick up your cross. Follow me. And that's a familiar phrase, though. We understand that. Like, oh, I got a cross to bear. Oh, I got a bad back. <laughs> I guess it's, I guess it's my cross to bear. We say that, don't we? You know, we say, oh, I, I love my job. I love my work. It's so great. But my boss, he makes me do all this continuing education. <laughs> my cross to bear. What does it mean to actually bear your cross and follow Christ? What we're going to look at is, is breaking down what it means to carry our cross, what it means to be a follower of Christ. We're going to look at the clarity of the cross, the reality of the cross, the duality of the cross, and fourthly, the perpetuality of the cross. Here's the first one. The clarity of the cross, Jesus defines for us. What does it mean to carry a Christian cross? We could get into a whole lot of other definitions, but Jesus defines it very simply. Your cross is self-denial. Your cross is saying no to yourself and yes to Jesus. Saying no to your thoughts, your feelings, and your ideas, and yes, to God's own words. It is essentially this, denying yourself. We started out this sermon by filling in this blank. How, how, how many of you thought that this is, this is it, what I should fill in the blank with? That I must deny myself. I mean, this is our big idea for the day, that, that Jesus himself says in his word, you want to know what religion is about, what spirituality and, and a relationship with me is about? You must deny yourself as a direct result of your relationship with Christ. And there's a lot of good things you could have put in the blank, a lot of true things you could have put down that I must experience forgiveness as a result of my relationship with Christ. You can put in there that I must know eternal hope as a relationship, as a result of my relationship of Christ. So many good things we could have been in there that I must be forgiven, experience peace, experience hope, that I must know joy as a result of my relationship with Christ. And would all of those things be true? Yes, they would. And yet none of those things could be, Jesus says, if we do not first deny ourselves. This is the essence of the Christian life, and Jesus speaks with it with remarkable clarity. Don't, don't confuse anything else. Don't worry about anything else. He says, you want to be my follower? This is it. Deny yourself. And he gets even more real about it with the reality of the cross. He says, this is for everyone, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever. And, and notice what it says after that, wants. Jesus willingly took up his cross. We are to willingly want to carry ours. This is, this is 
the reality of the cross, that it's for all of us, that we're to do it willingly, out of, out of love for God, out of, out of nothing but gospel-motivated hearts, nothing but the generosity of God himself moving us is what should want us to be his disciples. And there is no optionality here. You must do this if we are to be his disciples. Jesus speaks with remarkable clarity. He brings to bear the reality of this, that it is for all of us. And he also speaks about the duality of this, that, that there is on either side of the road of self-denial, two ditches. There's self-righteousness and self-pity. And neither of them are self-denial because both self-righteousness and self-pity are selfishness. Jesus, talking about what it means to carry our cross, says we need to deny ourselves. On one side of the ditch, or one side of the road, rather, is a ditch called self-righteousness. And it's a very familiar one because, really, we know in the Christian faith that God has provided with us up for us abundantly. I mean, just stop for a second and think about this. We have good things in our life that God has given us forgiveness, that God has given us hope and joy. On top of that, well, he's given me good physical things too. I mean, I have clothes on my back. I have a roof over my head and I have a bank account that is adequately full enough so that I'm able to have food on my table and fun things to do. You know, I guess I don't have to worry about very much because, well, God provides for me. And I guess because he provides for me, I, I don't really need to pray that much. <laughs> and because I, I don't have to pray that much, I mean, it's true, God loves me all the same. I don't have that much to be sorry about. I mean, I hear it all the time. <laughs> I mean, it's a little serious that pastor always starts out every one of our services with words of forgiveness. I mean, I know I'm not perfect, but I mean, come on, every single Sunday. And on top of that, we get real somber during the season of Lent about it. <laughs> no, no. I mean, okay. I mean, I know my brother-in-law needs it. <laughs> I know my cousin and definitely my neighbor needs it, but I'm not that miserable. I don't have that sad of a life. You see how easy it is? How, how quite simply we can take all of the good things that God has given us and we turn in on ourselves. We just make it all about ourselves. It's the ditch of self-righteousness and, it, and it's not self-denial. It is not giving up ourselves what for the sake of the gospel. It is not losing for Christ. It's, it's simply losing ourselves in ourselves. And as quickly as it comes about, well, we fall into the other side of the ditch called self-pity. Because as soon as one thing that we loved from God gets taken away, he does not care. Huh. Nothing could change in our actual circumstances, but one thing sad happens to us. Where is God? Why doesn't he provide for me? His promises say he's always going to be there for me. That's just one thing. Or maybe it's that thing, that sin that we do again or again and again. And we think, God, no way. No way could God forgive me. No way is that, is that forgiveness real. And you see what's happening, don't you? It's just the other side of the same coin. It is not selfishness in the self-aggrandizing sense. It's selfishness in the self-loathing sense. It's selfishness in the self-pity sense. And it's not a denial of self. It is not picking up our cross. There is this strange struggle that takes place in the life of the Christian. It's a duality, if you will. It is at once thinking about ourselves in self-righteous terms or in self-pitying terms, and this is the last one, to know that it is for life. Jesus said that this struggle is for life. Your Savior's cross 
this is going to sound crazy to say, but was not as hard as yours. His was three hours. Yours is more. Yours is not just like, uh, okay, if I overcome this sin or this bad day, then Jesus promises that he'll look on me and say, oh, well done, my good little Christian. No more. No more crosses. No, he says, this is the way. You must. Whoever want to be my follower, it's got to be a cross. And crosses. We, we don't talk about this very often, but they're, they're adorning all of our, our churches. We wear them around our necks, but these are heavy things. They give you splinters. They broke backs. There was blood. Crosses aren't good in a very real sense in our lives. And Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, the not good things you must carry. He asked some really good questions at the end. Jesus, in wrapping this up, he asked a question. He said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet give up their, their soul? We can explore that one, but let's just look at his last one. He says, what can you do? What can you give in exchange for your soul? And as we bear down on, with remarkable clarity, the reality of the duality and the perpetuality of the cross, it's heavy. There's nothing, there's nothing we can do to stop this back and forth oscillation between right self-righteousness, self-pity. How can we stay on a way of self-denial? What can we possibly give in exchange for this? You know it's nothing. And you know it's there. <laughs> at that place where you completely despair of yourself, oh, deny yourself that this comes ringing in. We have now been justified. How? By his blood. The necessity of his cross, do you see? It makes the necessity of your cross even possible for us to talk about. Romans 5, we have now been justified by his blood. How much more? How much more are we going to be saved by God's wrath through him? You think, wait a second, you think that he took care of you only when you were his enemy and now that he died for you, he's just going to let you fend for yourself and, and carry your own cross? Oh, no, 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 no. How much more shall we be saved by God's wrath through him? For if while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more? How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life, his life, in you, in your life. It is not only his cross that makes possible us to even have a conversation about crosses, but it is him in you that allows you to actually pick up your cross and follow him. Why? He goes on. In closing, he says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. God's word today, it, it makes us rethink what we would put in the blank of what we must do as a result of our relationship with Christ. He says, this is it. You must deny yourself. It's the only thing that can go in there. There's no other options about what you fill the blank in with. There's no optionality. Everything else flows from this, this denial of self, this cross-carrying life. And then he says this, he says, if you're ashamed of me saying this, I'm ashamed of you. If you're not about this word, I'm not about you. Do you see how he links them together? He said, me and my words, not just this one, all of them. And this one, by the way, is a culmination of all of them. You can't have me without these words. And it reminds us that, that we have been so ashamed of this part, the cross part. We only want the crown part, but the cross is necessary. And we're reminded how often we've been ashamed of him and his words but he has not been ashamed of us. Romans 5. You see, while we were still powerless, Christ died on the cross, his cross, for the ungodly. 
It's very rare that anyone will die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for you in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died. While we were still sinners, Christ necessitated for himself that he must suffer and die and rise for you. It's not in your bulletin, but Jesus wraps his whole, whole teaching up to this crowd with some, with some curious words in, in verse one of chapter nine. He said to them, very truly, I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. What does that mean? Is he talking about Jesus coming back at the end of all things? Is he talking about how, oh, maybe some of these disciples aren't, aren't actually going to die who are standing here? Jesus is talking about his kingdom coming. And his kingdom is going to come at the end of all things. He's going to usher that in. But you also know when his kingdom comes? It comes through the message of the cross. It comes through the message of the gospel. Jesus' kingdom is wherever that message comes of the cross of reconciliation, where that's proclaimed, there his kingdom comes. So you want to know what he's talking about in these words? It's you, not dying yet, still alive, seeing his power. How do you see that? Where do you see that? It's under the dear cross the dear cross that God has, he set one, at least one, on every one of you. A cross that, yeah, has splinters and causes pain, but a cross that is remarkably beautiful because it produces in you good. Good that can only come from a God who makes us rethink suffering and crosses as a whole. For how? He uses it to build in you good. Romans 5, we also glory in our sufferings because we know, we know, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to you. May God grant that we think, rethink all of our crosses. Amen. Would you please stand? Would you please stand for a reading of the gospel? It is our tradition to stand, to give honor and glory to the words, every one of them, of Jesus. Rome, Mark 8. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. They called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ.